So today it's my pleasure to receive uh, Grace Fu, Minister for Sustainability and the Environment of Singapore. So Grace, uh, great, great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so the session today is really about looking at Singapore as kind of a laboratory for the future. And the idea came about uh, from uh, first personal experience living in Singapore, visiting Singapore regularly, but also from actually uh, reading science fiction. Uh, <laughs> so on, on this, uh, in this event, we have uh, sci-fi author Neil Stevenson, who's very famous for talking about the metaverse uh, already decades ago, uh, but more recently writing a, a book called Termination Shock, uh, which is a climate fiction looking into a not-so-distant future where a number of uh, extreme weather events and a uh, number of other uh, situations lead um, a, a group of people to actually uh, start to do uh, global uh, geoengineering projects. Mm -hmm. And some of the people who are uh, invited to you know, evaluate uh, this as an option are places that are vulnerable to cl climate events, but also others have the resources to potentially do something about it. Among them are the Netherlands, uh, the city of London, and also Singapore. Uh, so the, Singapore is very interesting, uh, I believe, because it's not only an island nation in the tropics uh, that's uh, uh, vulnerable to um, uh, potentially storms, uh, like uh, very hot weather, but also uh, is very constrained in terms of land and resources, uh, in terms of energy, food, and industry. But uh, it's one of the few nations actually able to do something about it since to, to its human and financial capital. So... Um, um, Minister, I'd, I'd love to ask you a bit more about uh, first uh, Singapore situation. How would how would you describe it in your terms, in terms of resources? Thanks so much, Ben. And uh, listening to you about the science fiction, I'm not entirely sure whether it's a good or bad thing to be listed as one of the countries. Um, and you know, for us, it's not a science fiction; it's real because we have to look at existential. Uh, you know, threat of climate change because we're a very small island, 720 square kilometers with five and a half million population. And that makes us um, to be a very constrained country. We're constrained in terms of land, obviously very, very, uh, you know, short of land. And as a result, we have very little options on renewable. We have very little uh, options on, for example, storing water. Uh, we have very little, con we, you know, land for agriculture or food farming. Uh, and uh, we have a small market size. So these are all constraints that we need to work with while we have to look very long term uh, about the possible threats of climate change. And as you have said, although it is in a science fiction, but we are already seeing many of the impacts on climate change today. Uh, so if you looked at the papers, you see, you know, dry river beds in Europe, in China. To us, it means it's a threat to food security. Because when you don't have water, you don't have, you know, irrigation. And that's really the start of the story about, you know, variability in food production. And of course, instability will cause issues such as uh, food safety as well as food importation problems. Um, so to us, it's really, we need a, a very um, comprehensive, but at the same time, integrated plan. Because we are small, we have very little margin for error. So we want to bring all the relative, uh, all the relevant ministries and agencies together and come up with a long-term plan for Singapore, looking at all facets of uh, climate action and sustainable development. And this is in the form of a Singapore Green Plan, looking at using nature, living in nature, looking at sustainable living as a lifestyle, reducing our footprint, uh, having more recycling, looking at energy mix. How do we look at you know, issues such as energy efficiency and also energy security and also green economy? Because climate change, as we shift, as we transit, is not just threats, it's also op opportunities for, for us to really be in the forefront of adoption, of development of new technology and services. Uh, and also looking a little bit more long-term is really to in build more resilience into our systems. Resilient in terms of ability to deal with higher temperature, higher humidity, our ability to deal with, say, uh, higher sea level rise and, you know, storm surges. So that's in the form of coastal protection. And even things like water and energy um, safety. So these are all issues that we look at it holistically and it charts out a path. We don't have the answers to all the challenges yet, 
but it tells us where are the areas that we need to work on and it directs our R&D efforts. Yeah, that, that's uh, effectively a lot of constraints to deal with. But uh, I, th I think what's really interesting about Singapore, it's its ability, uh, demonstrated ability over decades to make long-term plans. Um, and I'd like to go into uh, more details about some of the topics you mentioned. And one would be potentially the energy mix of Singapore. So if you could describe what's the situation and what's the plan? Well, we are uh, almost 98% on gas. Uh, because as we have no natural resources of our own, so we import our uh, fuel. Uh, we have switched over to gas probably 20 years ago. Uh, and gas gives us, you know, security at the same time, stability because it's available, it's accessible. But obviously we need to decarbonize. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, new, what we call switches of our energy. We're looking at, for example, importation of energy. Uh, including renewable energy. We started a small project of importing from Laos uh, and we, you know, that opens up, if the grid works, it opens up a huge uh, potential of um, cooperation with our neighbours. We're also looking at, um, you know, renewable energy such as solar. So although we are a very small country, we do our very best uh, where we can, rooftop of buildings, even on reservoir, we are putting uh, solar panels. Uh, really, yeah. all possible types of free space, uh, we will explore the installation of solar panels. So with reservoir, you're actually talking about floating panels? Floating panels, uh, we have two types in freshwater reservoir as well as at the coastal area of um, our channels. So it has to deal with different sort of tidal movements and also different way of uh, cabling for very resilient grid. Because obviously with tidal movements, you know, you could have other um, issue with the grid as well. These, these um, sort of uh, installations give us additional area for consideration so that we can expand the total area for solar panel installation. We're looking at probably multiply what we have now by four to five times uh, in terms of solar panel installation. Yeah, that's very impressive, but we see the constraints still. And uh, I think you also have some project for importing renewables from, uh, from Australia, is that right? So we have two outstanding, we have already announced that we're looking at probably two um, importation contracts. Uh, so we invite, you know, um, the business uh, sectors to probably consider tendering for those energy supply contracts. So they can come from the region, they can, they come from further afield. We have some interest from uh, Australian company, which is really to look at deployment of solar panel in the deserts and then power cabling, the, the energy su supply to Singapore. Uh, these are possibilities. We have not reached an agreement. We are still sorting out many of the issues with businesses. Uh, but this is the direction that we are going. We are not just constrained by our location. We are looking, looking at collaboration internationally for new solutions. Okay, so it, it looks like you Singapore already decarbonized uh, in a way, uh, the large part of energy mix by you know getting rid of coal and relying less on oil. So gas is already a step up, but then of course uh, there's more to do. Uh, is is nuclear uh, something that you're looking into despite the the land constraints? Yeah, I think if you look at the existing technology, the kind of security zone requirements uh, require a kind of radius of 10 kilometers or 10 to 16 kilometers in some cases that effectively, you know, basically cordon out almost the entire country uh, for a nuclear plant now at this current technology. Uh, but we are very interested in the new technologies and there are signs that uh, it's increasingly available the timetable has has moved forward so we are putting a, a, in a way a peg in our um, energy master plan uh, to consider nuclear as one of the options but obviously we have to meet many sort of criteria in order for, for us to put in in real investment dollars okay i'd like to go into uh, food food supplies food security uh, uh, now uh, so during my last visit in singapore uh, my f the first dish i had was uh, the national dish uh, chicken rice and i was actually uh, <laughs> yeah I, w I was actually concerned whether i would get good chicken rice because of the the recent issues there were with with uh, imports uh, and, and access to fresh chicken like overnight uh, due to uh, uh, limited um, uh, due to some issues in one of your, your trading partners uh, suddenly 30% of your chicken imports and pretty much all the fresh chicken was suddenly unavailable overnight so people might not realize what kind of trauma <laughs> that is for Singapore but uh, that, for me that was kind of a 
uh, really interesting to think about. And uh, I'm wondering what kind of plans uh, Singapore has in terms of, uh, of food uh, security or independence in the long term. Benjamin, you're right. We're a big foodie country. And of course, it, the first week was traumatic. Uh, but we quickly you know, brought in a substitution. And our chefs, uh, I must say, and our hawkers have really been very resilient. They have moved on to use other forms of chicken protein, including frozen uh, chicken, uh, to prepare your favorite dish. Indeed, I think this is really a, an example of what could come when there is um, variation in food supply. Uh, of course, I think in this instance, it's really brought on by, you know, Ukraine war as well as energy crisis because it has really just caused havoc uh, in the prices of fertilizer, in the prices of feedstock. And therefore, in order to keep the price of chicken meat that's, that's manageable for the population, many countries have resorted to restrictions on exportation in order to stabilize their domestic market. And for a country that relies 90% on importation, obviously, I think this is a really um, big lesson for us to learn. And um, we have started to diversify our sources already many years back, uh, really looking at spreading our risk across the entire globe. So we import chicken, for example, as far as um, Australia, from America, from South America. Uh, really is to di diversify so that we have more sources and hopefully it can help us to mitigate the shocks from any single market. Having said that, um, you know, global warming is actually going to cause a lot of these considerations, a lot of these changes in calculations because we could talk about systemic change uh, in conditions. Uh, so, for example, if we buy most of our rice from Indochina and if we have the same condition that's affecting that geographical location, we may have to deal with shortage in rice. So we're looking at how to manage our supply better, including how to hatch our sources so that we can uh, be we can assure of our food safety. Part of our plan really is to grow some capability onshore. Uh, we started this in 2019, actually bef before COVID, uh, really to look at food security and starting from local cap capability. So we have a 30 by 30 plan, which is to grow 30% of nutritional needs by 2030, starting with several food types, uh, aquaculture, fish mainly, leafy vegetables, uh, and also eggs. Uh, as you know, we have very little land. So whatever we are doing here, it must be highly productive, must be highly resilient to diseases, to climatic changes, and it has to be highly productive uh, on a land area basis. So we hope to create competency and, and, and excellence, science and tech, in doing this well, agri-tech well in urban farming, and also in local Asian varieties because I think a lot of the technologies now are very um, you know very dominated uh, by sort very of western centric western kind of uh, culinary uh, preferences so we really want to look at what we can do uh, for Asian tastes such as you know yours chicken rice so uh, we'd like to assure you that um, although we won't have our own sort of chicken locally produced chicken meat now, but we do have alternate protein, which is cell-grown chicken. We are the first in the world to approve the commercial sale of um, cell-based meat. Uh, we believe that this is novel at this point in time. It's, it's expensive. It's small scale. But if you look at a world where you know uh, we may have problem with clearing of land for agriculture, or we have issue with animal welfareism, uh, that people prefer to have you know cell-based meat, having meat without killing an animal. This may be a sector. Uh, that will really allow us to grow uh, food sustainably with much, much reduced um, carbon footprint. Now, what you describe is also to, to be a close to the domain of science fiction, but it's a reality in Singapore. Like uh, uh, what you describe in terms of food production, uh, in terms of uh, uh, working on <coughs> resilient crops, uh, all this is, uh, is also um, uh, really at the forefront, uh, I think. And uh, also the what... What you, you mentioned regarding policies uh, is, is also a good indicator that as a nation, it's possible uh, to be an innovator on the policy front as well. 
Um, so what, you, what you're planning for food security, but also what you described for, from uh, cellular agriculture and uh, the, the, being the first nation to actually uh, legalize. You're absolutely um, right. The food safety framework is very important because for any investors, they will want to know what's the hurdle to clear before they can sell their, you know, their meat, their cell-based meat. So we need to have a clear regulatory framework for any new investors in this field. And that's something that we are building up so that there's clarity, that, that they know exactly what are the sort of uh, markers that they need to clear before they can you know, have their meat uh, commercially sold in the market. Uh, but it's also about how do we um, interest uh, companies that's very interested to, for example, look at better way of farming. So tamasic rice is something that uh, we have um, invested in, we have uh, created from our R&D lab, uh, a, a kind of variety in rice that allow us to get much better yield, but with much lower water required. As you know, in rice farming, the submerging of a uh, rice paddy field in water is what caused the greenhouse gas emission, the methane gas emission. Uh, that's and right. that's up to about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So if we are able to grow rice without submerging and without the need of as much water, then I think we are ready for a much more um, climate stress uh, world. Yeah, I'd like to touch upon also your background because you work in government now, but you've been working for a very long time in the private sector. So how does it inform your vision of, uh, of policymaking and uh, those different aspects of, uh, of our industries? I suppose in uh, my private sector background has taught me to be a more pragmatic environmentalist. Uh, first of all, I think um, in the business, you're always looking at possibilities as well. So you're pushing the boundary, but at the same time, you're also um, very cognizant about the business reality. Uh, so how do we manage this transition in an orderly way? pushing it in a direction that will benefit uh, companies as a whole, uh, including the small companies, for example, that's very uh, important politically in many societies. Uh, I think my business background has helped. So we want to have a orderly managed transition, but at the same time, the right policy framework that will encourage companies to make the right investments in the right green products and services. And carbon tax is one of those uh, exam is one of those policy levers uh, where I think it is most equitable. It's really put the cost on the, pers the companies that's producing the CO2 and really putting an explicit cost on the externalities that businesses are creating in the environment. And with that, we hope that companies that are emitting CO2 will have all the incentives uh, to change, to minimize their carbon tax and also to find new ways to manage the cost of operating in Singapore. Yeah, you mentioned the carbon tax also as something that's scaling up uh, fairly rapidly. So uh, what is the current level and what, what are the, the plans for future years? At the moment, it's, it's $5 per ton. Uh, but in two years' time, in 2024, it'll go up to 25. It's five times. And then in another two years, it's 45. Uh, and by 2030, we're looking at a range of 50 to 80. Okay, yeah, that's a very pretty quick ramp up. In terms of industries uh, in Singapore and in terms of innovation, so uh, Singapore is a small nation. It has some R&D efforts, but it also has um, uh, very large sovereign funds able to invest globally. Uh, there's Temasek, there's GIC. Uh, on the, the, in, the, in our event, we have Gen Zero, which is a new fund set up by Temasek focused on decarbonization. So how do you look at working with innovators uh, from around the world and what what kind of industries are of particular interest to Singapore? I think that, uh, first of all, as you say, there's a really um, emphasis on R&D and that has to uh, come from government because some of these R&Ds are very uh, long dated uh, and it has risks that companies may not be able to assume. So we go into some of these basic research, uh, we fund them and we hope that some of them will attract uh, investments from corporates if, if they do have, uh, you know, uh, good opportunity for commercialization. Uh, so in that area, when it's moved from the lab into the market, I think that's where a lot of opportunities reside. And uh, we have 
platforms to encourage that commercialization of R&D products. And of course, I think the ecosystem is getting very interesting. We have a lot more um, green carbon services companies, investment companies, including uh, Tomasic and including Tomasic linked companies, but really to try to create little ecosystems along energy, along food, along decarbonization, along hydrogen, smart grids, for example, because this this transition cuts across so many sectors. It's probably one of the most important transition uh, of our lifetime globally. I think no industries can really be you know, um, protected from this change. So if we need to transit, uh, how do we do at what pace and how can we you know, really promote the movement, the momentum, so that really we can all benefit from new jobs and new um, products and services. So we want to create that ecosystem in Singapore. Uh, Gen Zero is one that's really looking at you know, green carbon credits uh, and also including the support the supporting services in measurement, in reporting, in verification to help uh, countries, to help businesses package new carbon credit projects in the region. Uh, it's, we, we are very much into um, creating the useful nexus between petrochemical, between aviation, between maritime and finance hub activities in Singapore. In a small island, 720 square kilometers, we have all these important functions here, a, a big petrochemical refinery center for the world, a large maritime center, a large aviation center. How can we find, for example, solutions such as um, air, maritime decarbonization, use of ammonia or hydrogen for shipping? How do we find um, sustainable aviation fuel? How do we, you know, look at the safe, uh, the safe handling and storage of this new fuel? We hope that Singapore will be a place for discovery, for innovation, and also to find financiers to be, you know, there to provide the impetus to give these uh, products and services a push into the market. I think uh, this is a great, a great conclusion, uh, Minister, uh, to basically see how Singapore is looking at the world for, for innovation. And uh, I think, uh, and I hope that the world will also look uh, increasingly at Singapore to see how, they, how you implement all those innovations, what kind of policies you work with, and uh, how you achieve uh, all those, uh, those results uh, regarding food, energy, industry, uh, decarbonization and security that uh, well, I think the entire world is now looking at. Yeah, we hope that uh, we will bring some of these um, uh, science fiction ideas into reality soon. Uh, and uh, the chicken rice will be waiting for you, Ben, when you next come to Singapore. And I, I hope everybody will get the chance to try it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much for the opportunity.